Welcome back to my channel, everybody. If you're new here, I'm Claudia. I am super excited you're here with me today because today we're talking once again to Dr. Robert Mathis, who is an incredible physician from Santa Barbara, California. I had Dr. Mathis on my channel a few weeks ago and we talked about estrogen and hormone replacement. If you have not seen that video, you have to check it out. It was incredibly informative and I will link it in the description box. But in today's video, we're going to be talking about thyroid and thyroid disease, a very important subject. And several of you have left questions for Dr. Mathis. We will do our best to answer those questions. However, if you have any more questions for Dr. Mathis, please feel free to either leave them in the comments below or I will link all of his information in the description box. So reach out to him, email him, call him, text him, and I know he will get back to you and answer your questions. So without further ado, let's talk to Dr. Mathis about thyroid and thyroid disease. Hello, Dr. Mathis. Thank you so much for being with us again tonight. Okay, you're welcome. Hello. Mm -hmm. We are talking about the thyroid today, very important subject. Um, tell us briefly what the thyroid is, what functions does it have, okay. and why is it so important? So it's a butterfly-shaped gland in the neck, right below the cartilage here. And the thyroid is the regulator of body energy. The thyroid is also a regulator of the body's temperature. So the thyroid helps to release heat, and it also helps to provide energy for the body to do its various processes, such as grow hair and not lose hair, <laughs> things like that. Okay. okay. Now, there are obviously several different thyroid diseases. Category one would be normal thyroid. Category two would be abnormal functioning thyroid, which can be either inherent or congenital, or you can have a autoimmune disease. So if you have low functioning thyroid with autoimmune disease, you'll see antibodies. That would be Hashimoto's disease which causes a breakdown of the thyroid and releases T3 and gives you an artificially elevated T3 or artificially normal T3, even though the person feels poorly. And then there's, there's a different type of autoimmune disease that affects the thyroid receptors, and that's called Graves' disease. So Graves is hyperthyroid, where the receptors are acted on by the antibodies, to the receptor and they cue the receptor to make more thyroid. So when you look at those labs, you see super high elevated T3s and T4s, that's real hyperthyroid. Some physicians will interpret low TSH as hyperthyroid, which is not, not nearly, not even close to always the case. Very rarely is that the case. So there's autoimmune thyroiditis, there's hypothyroid without autoimmune thyroiditis, which is just low functioning thyroid that can be from toxins or it can be inherent in a particular person. Some people are born with low thyroid. That's it. And they have it their whole life. And then there's thyroiditis and then there's Graves disease, which is another type of autoimmune process that drives the thyroid to go into hyperdrive. Now you brought up a couple of things I want to get back to in a second, but tell us really briefly, you said T3, T4, and TSH. Can you just tell us what they are? So TSH starts at the brain and comes down from the pituitary and tells the thyroid to make T4. So the TSH level comes down, tells the thyroid to make T4. The thyroid makes the T4, which is not the principal hormone. The principal hormone is T3. So T4 in a normal person through an enzyme would break down into T3. And then T3, a per certain percentage of the total T3 would be free T3 floating around in the serum and can go to work on the receptors at the nuclear level. So we have T4 made by TSH telling the thyroid to make T4. Then we have T4 breaking into T3, total T3, which then breaks down into free T3 and then partially bound T3, bound to albumin and so forth. But the active hormone is the free T3, which drives the system and creates the energy and the heat and the, those two messages. And then there's T4. If it doesn't break down into T3 or total T3, it can break down into reverse T3. Okay. And that breakdown is important because three things can happen. One is if you take too much T4, you can make a lot of reverse T3 and slow the whole thyroid down. This is an ancestral break 
it's designed to protect us in times of famine mm -hmm. or stress when we can't eat. When the reverse T3 elevates, it basically turns off the thyroid. So reverse T3 is a plus and it balances the free T3. Those two are in balance. So when I measure reverse T3 and free T3, I'm looking at the two of them and see, well, where are we? Does the person have a lot of brakes and no gas or do they have a lot of gas and no brakes? Typically, it's probably better to have a little more gas than brakes. People feel better. But when that reverse T3 is elevated, you have a person who tends to not feel very good. And that can be from sleep, insomnia, difficulty with sleep, breathing, apnea. It can come from the T4 dosing and it can come um, from stress. And those kinds of things will change that balance. Now, since you brought that up, I wanted to wait a little bit for that question, but you're talking about T4 dosing. I have hypothyroid. You gave me a prescription for it. But sure. before I saw you, every doctor always wanted to put me on either Synthroid or Levoxyl, which is, what, Lex, Lex, what is the other one? T4, yes, exactly. Yeah. So what is the problem with putting people on synthetic thyroid, which is basically okay. just T4? So there's two issues. One is I like to use bioidentical molecules because the body knows what to do with them. And when they sit on the receptor, they stimulate the receptor in a usual and customary fashion. When you use non-bioidentical molecules, there can be an over or under stimulation of the receptor. And therefore, the response to that particular medicine is different than what you would hope for. I like to use bioidentical molecules. So I want to use, you can get what's called USPT4 and compound it with USPT3. And you can make up a natural thyroid that way, which is both, both of those are animal thyroids, which are basically the same bioidentical as we are. And it's easy for us to process and metabolize those, those products. When a person gets Levoxyl or Synthroid and they get a high dose, like, you know, 150 mics, 200 mics, 250 mics, those kind of things, typically over 100, all percentage of people who will convert somewhere 30%, maybe more, maybe less, they'll convert that T4 into reverse T3. And the reverse T3 goes up, 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 and... How the patient describes it is, wow, I feel so much better. Since you upped the dose, I feel better. You know, they'll go from, say, 100 to 125 mics, and the person will say, I feel much better. I just I, I couldn't believe how much better I felt. And about two to three weeks later, the reverse T3 catches up with that dose. And the reverse T3 just goes up, climbs a little, and then the person says, you know, I don't feel good anymore. I, I just, I think we need to up it again. They up it again, same thing happens again, up it again. And when you look in the literature or go to this website called Stop the Thyroid Madness, which is a very nice website, a lot of information there, mm -hmm. the answer is that doesn't work. For that particular person, all you're doing is putting them in a cycle. They're not going to feel better. Pharmaceutical grade T3 that's out there, the standard product is bioidentical molecule. The Synthroid is not a bioidentical molecule. It's got a hydrogen here or there in the wrong place. So I can use the free, the, what's called liothyronine, L-I-O thyronine, liothyronine T3. We can use that, no problem. And that's a bioidentical molecule. And it's also paid for by insurance a lot of times. So therefore, I can kind of sneak around compounding thyroid, which I have to do a lot because of the excipients. In other words, the carrier material, which is sometimes cornstarch, lactose, uh, methyl cellulose, pine wood. If I need to get away from that, then I'll go to a compound and I'll use like rice flour, which is perfect. Most people are okay with that and put a little T4, T3, compound it. And I've gotten people out of trouble by doing that. On T4 only, a lot of times, mm -hmm. most people can't break it down mm -hmm. and to T3, which then goes to free T3. I have just recently had a couple of patients who do better on levoxyl. Oh, no. Are you kidding? No. <laughs> most of the time, that's not true. And most of the time, you got to give them the T3 or something like Nature Throid or Armor or something like that, which is a bioidentical pig source or beef source uh, thyroid molecule. But I have a couple people now who are okay on Levoxyl, which is they convert it. They're okay. So, hey, if that works, everything's good.
they yeah. feel good, you know, then the answer is you're done. And most of the time, that's not true. Well, I have heard a lot of people say, I was hypothyroid, I am now taking thyroid medication, but I still don't feel good. And right. without fail, when I ask them, what are you on? It's T4 only. There is a number of articles that spell it very clearly that people have, the patients have voted to be on T4 and T3 combinations mm -hmm. and feel much better on those combinations. So you can't argue with the studies that are out there. You know, thyroid is, it's difficult. And it's hard for some people to understand. And they made it very confusing about 30 years ago when they came up with the various tests that they had at the time, which didn't, they didn't test for free T3. They weren't able to do that. And so they had, they had something called T3 uptake and they had a couple of other tests were very confusing. So a lot of doctors just kind of, you know, they got so much to do poof, that that little window's gone. They close the door. They, they they're done here. Take this. You have to have a little T3 most of the time and a small amount of T4. Or you'll just convert it into reverse T3 and block the whole thing. I have had doctors tell me that um, natural desiccated thyroid, which is what you were talking about, armor, those sort of things, are dangerous because they're not regulated. What do you say to that? So in order to get a product on the market, it must go through Good Manufacturing Practices Act in the U.S., it must meet the GMPs and the SOPs that are designed from the GMPs. And these operating orders that are developed by the company spell out exactly how to make the product and to guarantee that the dose is the dose they say it's going to be plus or minus 10%. Mm -hmm. Recently, Nature Throid was on the market and it was recalled because a couple of lots were a little bit under. In other words, instead of being one grain, they were more than 10% off. So they were 0.9 or 0.85 grains instead of 1.0 grains. So they recall them. The FDA says you have to be within this boundary, this range to produce the product. So that product's gone for the time being until they, I guess, redo it and prove to the DEA or FDA that they can make the product properly, get it tested. And then a year from now <laughs> or more, they'll bring it back. In the meantime, we're stuck with with NP thyroid, Urfa, and Armor. Those are kind of the three natural thyroids. That's a question I actually got from a viewer because the natural desiccated thyroid keeps getting reformulated. Right. What are the options we have when they keep getting reformulated? So the excipients, the things that they put in there besides the thyroid called excipients, they are problematic for some people. Mm -hmm. Some people react to the excipients. Some people react very violently. They don't feel good at all. So the answer is you have to compound it. When you compound, you've got to go to a, a reputable compounder and have them take the USP T4, USP T3, and mix them together in a four to one ratio or any ratio that you choose based on what you need. And you can change that ratio depending on how the person responds to the thyroid. Or you can have it like a T4 by itself and a T3 by itself and just basically put the T4 at, like I said, about 50 mics which is a nice number, and then just add a little T3 until you get to the person point where they're comfortable. About dosing thyroid. Dosing thyroid typically is, the T3 has about a five-hour half-life. So it typically lasts from morning until lunch, one or two, and then there'll be a lull or a sag right there around two or three, and people complain that they just, they run out of gas in the middle of the afternoon. So I say take an additional dose at noon, Get your extra five hours until dinner time, and then that's fine. If you get a little tired in the evening, well, we're supposed to get tired at night. <laughs> we're supposed to go to sleep. So if you take too much of it, you won't go to sleep. You'll be wide awake. So dosing in general is a couple times a day for some people, once a day for other folks, depending on their sensitivity, receptor sensitivity. So you really have to tailor any treatment you give to any patient for that patient. And this is another little problem with medicine is a lot of doctors don't have much time mm -hmm. and they're running on insurance and insurance says you get 7.6 minutes with people or whatever it is, 15, 20 minutes max. A lot of times that's not enough time. And then people don't get what they're looking for. I have found, and, and many of my friends have found the same thing, that most doctors aren't even willing to test for all of the necessary thyroid tests. Most of the time they test for TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone. Tell us what tests we really need and how so, we can get our doctor to test those. So 
let me this is out there you can see it out there on the web but i'm going to do it right now free t3 by tracer and you can do free t4 if you want to but i don't it's not a primary hormone but if you can see that can you see mm -hmm. that okay yeah okay so reverse t3 mm -hmm. which a lot of doctors don't believe has any value it's considered a research tool but not to me it's not free t3 by tracer versus free t3 by ria the usual the usual free T3 is by RIA. It's a methodology that has some interference with proteins in the serum. Okay. It tends to read high. Okay. So your doctor's going to say, you're fine. Everything's normal. Your TSH is fine. Your, your, your free T3 is fine. And the answer is, I've taken people and done both tests of reverse, the free T3 by tracer and the free T3. And the free T3 by tracer comes back super low when the free T3 by RIA is just normal. Okay. The problem is interference. The reason they call it by tracer dialysis is because they use a membrane, they dialyze, and they just allow just the, just the thyroid to cross the membrane, and then they read the thyroid more directly without the interference. And that's why it always comes back lower. So it's TSH is not an accurate measure of hypothyroidism, it's, hypothyroidism it's, any It's sort not of telling disease. me what's going on with the thyroid. It's telling me about the brain. Mm -hmm. When you want to look at thyroid, you got to look at these things. Mm -hmm. You got to look at reverse T3, free T3 by tracer dialysis. And if you want free T4, it's okay, but it's not a primary hormone. It doesn't, it doesn't drive the system like the T3 does. So... So why do you think most physicians will only test TSH and maybe T4, but not any of the other ones? You know, I think they just don't have enough time to really put it together. And I think that that they're all they're all bright people. They would not have gotten through medical school without being able to to learn the material and pass tests. But the answer is, when it comes to applying this knowledge, it's it's more difficult unless you have time. And I take a lot of time with the patients. We're talking the initial visit is a couple of hours or sometimes three or four hours if they're really complicated. And that's the but last. That's what it I takes. Had. That's what it takes to do it right. It's not it's never about the dollar. It's about taking care of the patient. And mm -hmm. when you have somebody call you and tell you that they have energy that they haven't had since high school. This is a yeah. good reward. Now, the good news is now with, when doctors don't want to prescribe these tests, there are actually some online tests you can order yourself. I just got you one can. on Amazon. How do yes. you feel about those tests? Are they accurate? Are they worth I am. I am. Taking? Well, these tests are done by LabCorp or Quest, the mm -hmm. primary labs here in the U.S. And so they're basically the same test I would order. The only difference is about $400. So instead of it's like 50 bucks instead of $400. So now what I'm doing and I've. I'm, I'm at that point where I just say, look, okay, here's the deal. If you don't have really good insurance, go online and get and get the online lab. Go get the free T3 by Tracer Dialysis. Go get the reverse T3. Life Extension has reverse T3. They have the female hormones, the male hormones. You know, they're $150. They got a panel, has all that stuff in it. And then the free T3 is at another lab, and that's fine. You just mm -hmm. you get it, you show it to your doctor, and he says, what is this? <laughs> that's the other problem how do you get it actually then you know analyzed? it's all about passion you really have to care and you really have to get into it and you have to have the time and there's no point in the, the best thing to do is just keep going till you get the doctor you want you brought a point up earlier saying that some thyroid disease can be caused by environmental toxins um, how much do you think environmental toxins allergens those sort of things okay, play so a part in thyroid disease Anything that can replace iodine can become a toxin. I had a couple that have a hot tub up on the hill here, and the latest hot tub thing is to put bromine in the water, not chlorine. Mm -hmm. Turns out bromine is more aggressive toward the iodine receptor, which then can block iodine and cause hypothyroid. So bromine in Mountain Dew has a lot of bromine in it. And so... You just don't want to do the do. <laughs> what about words, things? What about <laughs> allergens, gluten, dairy, those sort of things? 
all the, what happens with those is they can, through molecular mimicry, they can cross-react with receptors on the thyroid, produce the thyroiditis. The thyroiditis damages the way the thyroid works, and it can't produce the T3 it's supposed to, and then they become hypothyroid. It takes time, but it can happen. So here's your autoimmune stuff. You want to be careful with autoimmune diseases. They're not great. You need to, people need to check an ANA. And for thyroid, you want to do TPO and T thyroglobulin antibodies and TPO antibodies. So here, let's put that up on the screen. This is to check for autoimmune disease, the ANA with reflex. Okay. And then also you want to look at, for Hashimoto's, you want to look at TPO, thyroid peroxidase antibodies and thyroglobulin antibodies. Okay. And those two tests will tell you about Hashimoto's. And then the ANA is important just to look for general autoimmune processes. And we want to be sure there aren't any. Because that's our next frontier is autoimmune disease. And thyroiditis is tough because it, it reduces the function of the thyroid, makes people feel tired and or hyper because they'll get they'll get like an autoimmune attack and the thyroid gets T three gets released and they get they get like this. And then the thing quiets down and then there's no T3. And so they end up low and they get high and they get low and they, they get hyper and they get hypo and they kind of bounce back and forth. It's, it's tough. It's a tough problem. Thyroid is the master molecule that runs everything. No thyroid, you're tired, very tired. I mean, I've had people with severe hypothyroid, TSH is 56, TSH, you know, 80. Those, you can get, they can have congestive heart failure. They What's a normal from, TSH? Normal TSH is anywhere from 0.3 to about 5.0. Okay. And the range is, that's a population range. The functional range is more like 0.3 to 2.3. Okay. I kind of like to see it there. But if they have good free T3 and good reverse T3, kind of in the middle of the range, and they're sort of balanced, then there's something else wrong if they don't feel good. You brought up the range, the thyroid range. That's right. another thing. You know, we hear oftentimes, I have heard too, oh, you, your T3 is normal when it is at the very low end of normal. No, that's T3 RIA. Yeah. If you have a free T3 by tracer and that thing is on the low end, then that's definitely low thyroid. And I've actually said, you know what? Your thyroid's okay. You're, a, you're in the bottom 20%. We can give you a half a grain, a quarter grain, just to see what happens. And some people say, okay, let's try it. And they'll call back and say, oh, you know what? Half a grain. That's all I needed. It's great. I feel much better. And I have people running around on a half a grain, quarter grain. It, if that's all it takes, you're done. And then they're good. So you don't want to be at the low end of normal. You want to be in the middle or higher. In end general, normal. there's standard distribution like this, standard, standard distribution curve. It's nice if you're somewhere in the middle. If you're, it's adrenals, I like to see them in the middle or above. If it's thyroid, I like to see them kind of in the middle or maybe a little above. Reverse T3, I don't like it to be above the, the mean. I don't, I don't, I like it to be at the mean or a little less when it's 16 or 17, 18, it's okay, but let's not get it up in the 20s or even in the 30s. That's just too high. And that's breaks, that slows the thyroid down. Do you think that there's a connection between female hormones and thyroid disease? It seems that women oh, are more affected by thyroid disease, right? So estradiol is an anti-inflammatory. So when women are on their hormones and they have a decent level of estradiol cycling through, first of all, they're obeying the genes, number one, which millions of years ago that was set up. There's nothing we can do about it except obey it or not. Number two is estrogen is an anti-inflammatory. So it helps prevent inflammation. It helps prevent Hashimoto's. It helps prevent leaky gut to some extent. It's not perfect, but all these things reduce inflammation. So estrogen manages TBG. It's a, it's a binding globulin that binds up the thyroid. And when your estrogen is higher, TBG is higher. When estrogen is lower, it's lower. Testosterone makes the TBG go down. So if you give women testosterone and estradiol, you can balance that a little bit. So do you think that oftentimes women, when they start going into menopause, they gain weight? Some of that we've talked about can be estrogen, but could it also be that their thyroid is affected by the loss of estrogen, and that's why they're gaining weight? So in theory, there's some connections there, but you know, weight, 
I'm going to, that one is tough for me because I don't know if anybody knows what causes weight gain. We don't understand weight loss very well. And it's, it's not just simply energy in energy out. It's not that simple because there's all these different pathways that rule insulin and insulin sensitivity and estrogen and testosterone certainly involves adrenals certainly involved because if I give somebody a little hydrocortisone, they're much more sensitive to their insulin. Their blood sugars will drop. So we don't really understand what causes. We have no gain. clue. I don't think we really, we don't get the weight thing yet. There's a number of hormones in there. Some of them haven't been really, some of them are all research. You read the research paper and you get frustrated because I can't order those tests. I can't do that. So I have to get a lab, my own lab, create the lab and be able to run the test in my own lab. And then I can do weight loss, which I'm thinking about doing. It's just because it needs a solution. I'm thinking about next doing something like that. But That'd thyroid different. can definitely, low thyroid can definitely affect one's weight, right? Since it is affecting metabolism. There's a there's a thing called UPC, which is an uncoupling protein, and it's in the brown fat. And when you when you exercise, you get some, you increase that protein, which helps to create more heat in the body, and and more calorie loss, so to speak, in terms of heat. When you're not doing when you're not uncoupling that thyroid that mitochondria and producing all that heat you're just not burning the calories do you think that hypothyroidism can also cause somewhat of a depression hypothyroid can cause hypercholesterolemia hyperlipidemia it can cause some depression i mean the whole body's not working it doesn't you can't get rid of toxins the way you're supposed to the liver doesn't work the way it's supposed to because if you really have severe hypothyroidism the whole system is running so slow that it just can't detox. It can't do its job. The bowels may slow down. Maybe they get constipated. I mean, there's a lot of things that can happen with hypothyroid. I have a, one of my viewers asked about radioactive treatment for the thyroid. How do you feel about that and what are the okay. alternatives? All right. So when you look at it from the point of view of the institution, they say, look, you have hyperthyroid. The thyroid's on fire. You have these antibodies that are sitting on that receptor telling it to make thyroid. And it, it's it's very dangerous. You can have heart attacks. You can have uh, abnormal cardiac rhythms. You can have ophthalmic disease. There's a lot of things that can happen. So we don't want that to happen. So the quick fix is radioactive product. And it basically destroys the thyroid gland. And then you're good. Oh, hold on. What did you say? You're going to destroy my thyroid gland and I'm going to be good? Oh, okay. Thank you. So for, for me, that doesn't seem to compute very well. I mean, if I'm backed up in a corner, well, maybe. But would I rather use 1,500 to 2,000 of acetyl L-carnitine? Yes, you could do that. That will suppress it. Can I use a little bit of the medication? Yes, you can do that. And does the disease burn out in time? The answer is what I've seen is Although I may not have seen as many as an endocrinologist, but I've seen the disease itself just stop. Mm -hmm. The antibodies stop. And then I use a product called low-dose naltrexone. And low-dose naltrexone, N-A-L-T-R-E-X-O-N-E, -E, can be helpful for autoimmune processes mm -hmm. and help to re-regulate the immune system. So I'd rather not ablate the thyroid gland if I can find another way. This was really awesome, Dr. Mathis. As always, okay. I always learn something new from you. I don't know how many times we've talked already, but every time I learn something new. And I hope we answered all the questions my viewers had. Do you have anything to add? No, I'm good. Just uh, okay. let your viewers send a few, a few questions and we can go from there. Okay. And I will also link all your information down below and people can email you and call you. Thank you so much for being here with us and answering all these questions. And um, all right, you're, you're, you're we'll welcome. see you next time. Okay. Bye. All right.